Hi everybody, I'm Luna. Welcome back to Luna. Oi. April 30th is an important day here in Vietnam because it was the day we finally liberated the north and the south of Vietnam after 20 years of terrible war. My video this week is to celebrate that victory. I know that many of you might already have learned about this part of history through many Western books and documentaries written in English. But have you ever questioned the information that you read? Have you ever asked yourself, is this a full story or just a part of it? Is it really the truth or just propaganda made by the USA and its allies? What percent of this information is the truth? Well, I know that it's hard for you to find the answers because there are barely any reliable original sources from Vietnam to compare and check in English. And I also don't dare to tell you what to trust because obviously I'm not a historian. I am not Miss Know It All. I am just a normal Vietnamese woman who is interested in history. Luckily, I do speak Vietnamese, so I can assess information sources written in Vietnamese and under the Vietnamese perspective. And I can translate them into English and share them with you. So today, I'm gonna tell you about part of history which is very important to Vietnamese. This will all be according to the Vietnamese perspective, so I hope that this could offer you a counterpoint to what you read and see in Western news sources, and I hope that you might find it interesting. Oh, and here's a special side note. I really hope that some Vietnamese people who grew up in other countries will see this video. If you are Vietnamese American, or if you grew up in some other country and you grew up hearing a lot of bad things about the communists in Vietnam, I want to, first of all, say, hi, hello, I don't hate you, and I hope that you won't hate me. I hope you will listen to everything I have to say here. Maybe you won't believe what I say, maybe you don't want to hear it, but I think it is important for us to listen to each other so we can try to find some closure to the past. So please just hear what I have to say, and let's try to find common ground as friends. Now, on with the video. Hopefully you do already know that the USA lost the war to Vietnam. But how could we have won? How could a poor tiny country, a country that was colonized for more than 100 years, defeat the most powerful nation on earth? Well, the answer is very complicated. And there are so many underlying reasons that you could study it for years and still not have all the answers. But in this video, I'm going to just talk about the most important factors in the victory of Vietnam against America in 1975, just over 45 years ago. Let's start at the beginning of USA intervention. At first, it was actually a good thing. USA soldiers first fought in Vietnam during World War II, when some USA Special Forces soldiers helped Ho Chi Minh in his fight against the Japanese fascists who were occupying our nation. But as soon as World War II ended, the French decided that they wanted to keep Vietnam as a colony, and the USA sided with France. Ho Chi Minh came to the USA to ask for help in gaining independence for the Vietnamese, but he was refused because the USA wanted to support France's colonization of the USA. This is a long story, and probably something I will make another video on in the future. But let's fast forward to the exciting of the French and the creation of a puppet government in the south of Vietnam created by the USA. American leaders helped install Ngo Dinh Diem as president of the south in 1955. And over the next few years, he ordered hundreds of thousands of people to be arrested, tortured, and murdered. Thousands of villages were destroyed and burned. As a part of this murderous campaign, Jim's soldiers carried a guillotine, yes, a real guillotine, to murder people for all kinds of alleged crimes. The guillotines were imported by French colonialists to kill Vietnamese people in the early 20th century, and Jim put it to good use, killing over 2,000 people in a range of terror from 1956 to 1960. According to Robert McNamara, beheadings were for anyone convicted crimes ranging from murder to stealing farm implements and water buffalo or belonging to an organization 
fighting the U.S.-backed regime. They would kill anyone that they claimed was related to the communist army. By the way, if you don't know who Robert McNamara was, he was a businessman and World War II Army Air Force statistician who became Secretary of Defense of the USA and he was leading the war against the US in Vietnam. So I think it's safe to say he's not a biased communist source of information. There is a quote from this camp that I want to talk about now, which I think is interesting because it teaches us a lot about propaganda. According to my textbooks in college and many present-day government websites from Vietnam, President Diem said that he would rather kill innocent people than let a communist escape. Now, if you've watched Ken Burns' documentary on the Vietnam War, that line might be familiar to you because it was attributed to a northern Vietnamese officer, but no source was given for which communist officer might have said it. But the communists proved every bit as ruthless as the French. It is better to kill even those who might be innocent, one commander said, than to let a guilty person go. I personally believe that this was something Ziem said because there is a lot of documentation of Ziem saying many slogans like this at the time. But even if Ziem didn't say it, I don't believe any communist officer said this and I can't understand why Ken Burns would have included this in his documentary without any source unless it was just to make Vietnamese communists look like murderers. Anyway, one thing is for sure, the Xiem regime was so horrible that from 1959 to 1960, thousands of southern people rose up and tried to overthrow it. I know that a lot of Vietnamese anti-communists even now still believe that Diem and his southern government of Vietnam were good and Saigon was rich when he was in his power and that all southern people loved him. But if you look at the records and newspaper articles written in Vietnamese at that time, you will see that this just was not true. Diem was a brutal dictator who killed a lot of innocent people before the official war with America even began. It is true that back then, Saigon was beautiful and way more developed compared to Hanoi, the capital city in the north of Vietnam. But there was a lot of wealth inequality in Saigon at that time. Only a small number of Vietnamese people in Saigon were wealthy. The system back then only served the wealthy class, while hundreds of thousands of people were poor and exploited, were tortured and killed so a small number of elites could live in luxury. A small number of families benefited from a system while hundreds of thousands of people suffered from it. So when you see photographs of nice cars, fancy hairstyles, and glamorous living in Saigon during the 50s and 60s, remember that that was only a small slice of society in Saigon and most people were very poor in the South. That was why thousands of Southern farmers and workers protested. Millions of them became communists and tried to stop that genocidal regime. You really think that it was just the Northern Vietnamese people who fought the war against the Xi'an regime in America? No! We could never win without the help of millions of Southern Vietnamese people. If Xi'an's government and America were as good as American propaganda would have you believe, why do you think so many Southerners still joined the Communist Army? The war began because of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which I will probably also need to do a whole video on in the near future. But to summarize, the United States government lied and said that Vietnam attacked United States ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. It's a total lie! which was later proven by the Pentagon Papers, the memoirs of Robert McNamara, and NSA Papers revealed in 2005. So, actually, the United States lied so they could start their war with Northern Vietnam. From 1965 to 1967, America followed the policy of joint warfare in the south of Vietnam. American soldiers joined with thousands of anti-communist soldiers from the Army of the South of Vietnam 
to fight and kill communists. In 10 years of war, the number of bombs that America dropped on Vietnam was 7.6 million tons, three times higher than the total number of bombs used by every country in World War II in Europe. Laos and Cambodia were also victims of this indiscriminate bombing. Laos is now considered to be the most bombed country in history, and the only crime they committed was being next to Vietnam while we were being terrorized by the USA. I really feel sorry for Laos. Three years after America officially sent their armies to Vietnam, both sides, Vietnam and the USA, were suffering from heavy damage and started feeling desperate. And that was when North Vietnam launched the Tet Offensive. In 1968, the anti-war movement that was happening around the world, especially in the USA, was getting stronger. Vietnamese communist government saw this and realized the war was becoming increasingly unpopular. It was totally not what the United States expected. They thought they would quickly win the war, and now it seemed it would take many more years of fighting. So, the North decided to take decisive action to try and force America into meeting to de-escalate the war. The Tet Offensive started from February 1968 and lasted until the end of the year. It was called Tet because the first fight happened on Tet Holiday, the Lunar New Year of Vietnam. I will definitely make a video on this in the future because it was a very brilliant strategy by Võ Nguyen Giang, but for now, let's continue. By 1968, America had brought 800,000 soldiers to Vietnam. This was in addition to the 550,000 soldiers of the South Government of Vietnam for a total of 1.3 million soldiers. America was way more powerful than Vietnam in terms of economy, military, international diplomacy, and practically every other measurement. North Vietnam only had 300,000 soldiers in our army and a little help from China, Cambodia, and Laos. Nobody would have expected us to be able to stand up to the might of the USA. So of course, America and the puppet government in the south of Vietnam were totally surprised about how strongly the southern people supported the Vietnam Communist Army. After the Tet Offensive in 1968, we successfully forced America to sit with us and discuss peace. The damage from the Tet Offensive was so massive that both sides were reluctant for any more major battles for years. Vietnam and America spent year after year having peace accords, but that didn't mean the government of South of Vietnam ever stopped killing people. In July 1968, Nguyen Văn Thiệu, the new president of the puppet government in the South, approved the Phoenix program. It started as a proposal from CIA in 1960, but only became official after the Tet Offensive. The purpose of the Phoenix program was to spy on and assassinate communists. CIA agents and American consultants taught the Vietnam Southern Army how to torture and assassinate, which, of course, led to a lot of human rights violations. From 1968 to 1972, more than 26,000 people were tortured and murdered in many horrible ways that I can't even describe. Some of them were really communist, but most of them were just innocent farmers. This program did weaken the communist network in the south of Vietnam, but it also made hundreds of thousands of non-communist people become communists after they saw how their own people were treated and they realized that the southern government was not on their side. In 1972, after four years of discussion and pressure from many other nations all over the world, the U.S. finally agreed to sign the Paris Peace Accords to stop the war in Vietnam. FYI, the U.S. agreed to do this only because they saw the signs that they were already losing the war, not because they suddenly felt sorry for Vietnamese people. The Peace Accords should have been signed in October 1972, but Richard Nixon President of the U.S. held off on signing because he was running for re-election at that time. Thousands more innocent people died here over the next three months, but it was all just about Nixon's election. <laughs> and you know what? Right after winning the re-election, instead of signing the peace accords, 
Richard Nixon sent dozens of B-52 Shadow Fortress airplanes to bomb Hanoi on December 17, 1972. The B-52 was one of the most advanced models of military aircraft in the 50s and 60s. It had a typical combat range of more than 14 kilometers without aerial refueling. Each aircraft could carry 27 to 33 tons of weapons, and they mostly carry bombs. So why did America decide to bomb Hanoi? Well, it's because they were forced to sign those peace accords against their will. And there were many conditions in these accords that America didn't like, such as uh, withdrawing all military forces out of Vietnam and ending the existence of the U.S.-backed puppet government of the south of Vietnam. The USA attacked Hanoi because they strongly believed that they would cause so much devastation that the North Vietnam government would have to sign the accords with different conditions which were much better for the USA. But after just three days of bombing raids, 12 B-52 planes were shot down by the North. According to our calculation, if things kept going on at this rate, then after two weeks, America would run our bombers in all of Southeast Asia. Our great general Vong Nguyen Zab and his staff calculated that if we destroyed just 10% of USA B-52 airplanes, America would have to stop fighting the war. And we did it! Over 12 days, we shot down 34 out of 147 B-52 airplanes, equal to 17.6%. The total number of the airplanes we shot down was 81. This victory is so great that it was named the Dien Bien Phu in the air after the great victory we had in the town of Dien Bien Phu against France in 1954. And to this day, this was the only fight in which America's B-52 aircraft were shot down and destroyed by any enemy. By December 30, just a couple of weeks after starting their bombing runs over Hanoi, America had to stop bombing the north of Vietnam and even requested to have a meeting with Vietnam to sign the Paris Peace Accords. The Peace Accords between Vietnam and America was signed on January 27, 1973, and within two months, all American soldiers had to get out of Vietnam, but America was still able to send aid to their puppet government in the south of Vietnam, and American consultants could still remain here. So the war between North and South of Vietnam didn't really end. America still tried to intervene and control the situation in the south of Vietnam. So in 1974, the communist government decided to end the anti-communist regime in the south once and for all. By this time in the war, thousands and thousands of South Vietnamese soldiers lost their will to fight. Just from April to December 1974, 176,000 soldiers deserted from their own army in the South. The South was weakening as the Communist Army was growing stronger. We took this opportunity to finally launch a zero offensive on April 30, 1975 one year earlier than we initially planned. A few days before the Communist Army came to Saigon, the United States Secretary of Defense, James Rodney Schlesinger, announced a sensational theory. If communism takes control of the government in the South, 200,000 people might be killed. And immediately, the Pacific Stars and Stripes magazine spread this completely fabricated fake news all over the place, especially in the south of Vietnam. It caused panic among thousands of Vietnamese who had worked with the anti-communist government, and a lot of them decided to run away. The fact is, on the day the communist army came to Saigon and overthrew the puppet anti-communist government, thousands and thousands of Saigon citizens went out to the street to welcome our soldiers. BBC had a report on April 30, and there was no evidence of mass murder or torture or any kind. A lot of people who were scared before were now even surprised because the communist soldiers were so nice and they didn't steal or rob anything as they were told by Western media a few days ago. Actually, our communist army could have attacked Saigon one day earlier, on April 29th, but they waited outside the city so all the Americans in Saigon could have enough time to fly out. 
According to one of our generals, Chen Ban Jia, his army waited outside the city for one day before attacking because the purpose of the attack was to liberate Saigon, not to kill or shame them. Now, one thing to also understand is that there were a lot of neutral people in Saigon at this time. Thousands of people were not communists or anti-communists. They just wanted peace for both North and South of Vietnam. While the communists were helping with the invasion and the anti-communists were trying to escape, this third group of neutral citizens of the South elected Dương Văn Minh as president of the government of the South of Vietnam. He was only president for two days and he was the one who surrendered to the North. And as you know, according to memoirs of three generals who served under Dương Văn Minh's three-day government, the war could have gone on much longer. On the day Dương Văn Minh became president, a intelligence officer from France met with Minh and told him to ask China to help. China had secretly promised to attack the northern border of Vietnam if the South could hold their ground, which would give the South an opportunity to start the war again. But fortunately, Dương Văn Minh listened to his brother, who was a member of the Communist Party, and decided instead to surrender immediately to the North. And when President Ming refused the offer from the French intelligence officer, he said, Thank you for your offer, but I was once the henchman of France, then America. That was enough. I don't want to be the henchman of China. This story is in three different memoirs of three different Southern Zeros named Nguyễn Hữu Hạnh, Nguyễn Trang Thi, and Lý Quý Trung. I feel so lucky that Dương Văn Minh didn't fall into another trap and pull us immediately into war with China. I had to admit that Dương Văn Minh and the neutral peace seekers in Saigon did make the liberation of Saigon easier and much less deadly. Our former Prime Minister and Vice President in 2011 talked about them and thanked them for their help gaining the victory of the Vietnam Communist Party. I know that many of you, especially Vietnamese who live abroad, will ask me why so many Vietnamese people try to escape even a few years after the war. Well, the answer is, again, complicated. But I think the main reason was because many of them were extremely anti-communist and quite a few were rich before the communist army came. I believe that a lot of them must have been upset because their lands and wealth was taken by the government. Do you know why I feel comfortable saying this? Because this happened to my family. My grandpa was a very, very rich man from an ancient noble family and before the war, he had a lot of land and a lot of money. He had all his money and land taken from him during the war. And yes, this was difficult for my family to accept. I know this happened in the South as well. I am sure that a lot of people couldn't stand the idea of going back to a normal life without all that wealth. I know that a lot of normal and even poor families got involved with the anti-communists and became afraid because they didn't know what might happen. And yeah, some people were mistreated by Northern Vietnam soldiers. I know that too because, guess what? My grandpa was also tortured by North Vietnam soldiers because he was a rich wealthy man with lots of lands and peasants working for him. Yeah, that makes me upset to think about that. Of course, North Vietnamese soldiers did some bad things. I don't deny that. Every war has some terrible soldiers who do some terrible things. But that was not the official policy of the North of Vietnam. We didn't bring guillotine to the South and chop off the heads of thousands of people. In fact, Ho Chi Minh gave a speech one time and said it was a mistake to be so harsh against people like my grandpa. And I think, looking back, the North was too harsh against many people in the South after the war. But it doesn't compare to the genocidal terror that the USA and the South Vietnam puppet government very intentionally and systematically implemented against innocent Vietnamese people. To me, it's just not the same. And I say that as someone who comes from a family that was a victim. I think the Southern government was much, much more brutal. You know, communists and anti-communists in Vietnam had been fighting and killing each other for decades. And their hatred toward each other was very strong. So even a few years after the war, many anti-communist people were still treated badly by communist people. Some individual people wanted revenge. 
I know that was not good and it should not happen, and I want to say sorry for what families had been through. We all got traumatized from the war. My one grandpa was tortured by North Vietnam soldiers for being rich. My other grandpa died in the South of Vietnam in 1968, fighting as a North Vietnam soldier's intent offensive. So I definitely know about the suffering that happened on both sides. But one thing that we Vietnamese people are very good at is looking forward to the future. We have a very sad history, we know that. We suffered a lot for a very long time. Sometimes it felt like the whole world was against us, but we always look forward to the future. So if you are a Vietnamese person who grew up outside of Vietnam and your family fled from South Vietnam, I hope that you will look to the future with me and I hope that we can be friends moving forward. What I want to say in closing is that Vietnam has changed a lot now. We all try to forget the past and move forward to the future. If you have a chance to visit Vietnam, please don't hesitate to do it. I'm sure you will be surprised about how friendly Vietnamese people are to you and how beautiful this country is and our food is awesome too. We are the second and third generation born after the war. I hope that we can erase the hatred and have a chance to understand each other. We Vietnamese people living in Vietnam don't hate you and you're always welcome home. Okay, so that's what I want to say. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, see you next week. Bye bye. What kind of fighters are the Viet Cong that you met here? I would give anything to have two, 200 of them under my command. They're the finest soldiers I've ever seen. The Viet Cong. That's right. They are dedicated and they're, they're good soldiers. They're the best I've ever seen.